Hello, and welcome to From a Basement in Tulsa. I'm Jason Ferguson. Welcome to episode 40. That's so crazy to me. I remember Eric Hyman being here and us freaking out about episode 20. So thank you guys so much that have been downloading and sharing and, and, and making this thing really cool. Uh, for episode 40, I have one of the coolest guests I've had so far, which I know I say about every episode. But still, this episode I have a new friend named Steve Gherkin. He's the author of Hidden History of Tulsa, and he also is a contributing editor at This Land Press, which we've, I mean, if you're in Tulsa, we've all heard about. It's doing really cool things here in town, and I'm super excited to have him here. So thank you. I hope you enjoy this episode, and please check out his book. I'll leave a link to everything I can find about him, his videos, his his book on iTunes, and, and just everything I can find. So thank you so much. Enjoy the episode, learning a little bit about the hidden history of Tulsa. Hello, man. How you doing? I'm doing very well. If listeners who don't know, he is an author, many more things. But I found out about you, Steve, by I saw your book on just on Facebook. Somebody shared a link to one of your interviews, and I was like, "Holy cow! Hidden history of Tulsa. I have to read this immediately." And now you're here, and that's incredible to me. So, hello and welcome. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity. Just come across town and get to do this with you. I appreciate doing that. I, we've been very excited about the book, Hidden History of Tulsa. Um, it is is really kind of a second career for me, Jason. I was a dentist for 36 years and retired about five years ago. Not doing too much, really. Uh, <laughs> kind of putting bird feed in the bird feeder. And I um, I came across, a, ran into a fellow that said, we're starting this magazine. And I, as a, as a wine educator at Oklahoma State in my spare time and being in front of people and, uh, and writing some lesson plans and, and presentations, I said to him, you know, I should write for you. And he said, yeah, I think you should. So we got the editor down in our wine cellar. <laughs> and two bottles later, I pitched my first story. And it was, it was, it was a wine story about a man uh, with a vineyard in Oklahoma. It was the last wine story I've ever written. Um, the other 19 stories have been published in This Land Press um, deal with, with basically hidden history, colorful personalities, racial tension, things of that nature. Yeah, there's, there's a lot in your book that, that I'd only... In February of last year, I think I had just moved in this apartment and I moved from Collinsville, Oklahoma, which is just north here of, of Tulsa here. And I, I heard somebody somebody shared a link saying Oprah was going to do a piece on, on the Tulsa race riots. And I said, what are the Tulsa race riots? And, and so I had never, I was so surprised that I'd never even, I don't know if I'd even heard that, that sentence. So I went on a kind of adventure looking up stuff and and on the internet the internet is really great for finding information but it's also kind of bad sometimes because it's so easy to find false information so uh, i was i was glad to learn very researched very well thought and well put history of of that and then just amazed and surprised by the rest of the book because because that's a it's a considerate portion of the book but there's way more to read in there on that and i was like every chapter i was like no way no way uh what, what do you think was your maybe your most surprising thing to find or or maybe even favorite person to learn about <clears throat> not being a native Tulsan myself um, and moving here well, 30 some years ago I, I had no idea of, of the history of it and so doing his research for various articles kind of leads you from one thing to the next to the next to the next and um, I, w I the most most alarming thing to me is that um, Dick Rowland who was the young teenage boy that was accused of accosting a female in an elevator that kind of stirred up things with the white community and then the next day thereabouts they started this riot and killed hundreds of black people in Greenwood and the fact that when when the dust settled in Greenwood nobody really gave a good cahoot about Dick Rowland nobody really knew in fact what it shows is that at the time of the riot Dick Rowland had already been taken out of town by the cops to a destination unknown. And and never really confirmed where he went. Or, I mean, I was watching one of your videos, and I, I watched, you sent us some videos that you've been making, just, just sharing some information, and I'll link all of those on this description of the podcast, because I think everybody should really see them. They're really cool and informational, and you can get to kind of see you talk about what you've been writing about. But that was that's very strange to me, too. I never heard his name it's pretty fascinating that nobody even really took note of what happened to him afterwards well, dick roland is an, was an enigma 
from the first day that he came onto the scene, that we became aware of him, people uh, to the day that he died, whenever that was and wherever that was. We just don't know. He's one of those amazing mysteries. What's hard for us to imagine in today's society is that 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 can happen with all the social media and things you can find out about everybody all the time, anytime, to realize that people could change their names before Social Security in the 20s or thereabouts. You could just change your name anytime you wanted, anytime. You could move to Chicago, and I could be Jason Ferguson. And if I did, by the way, I would serve you well. I would. You, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you'd be that. proud of me as Jason Ferguson. <clears throat> uh, please continue to make good decisions if you decide to do so. <clears throat> I'll do the best I can. <laughs> I'll understand if you slip up a little bit, though. Yeah. If I had a free reign, I would probably, I don't know what I'd do. but yeah. So if I had be. a couple beers, it'd be okay with you. Oh, I would be disappointed if you didn't. Okay. All right. <laughs> So Dick Rowland was a very interesting uh, part of this. The, um, the, the Tulsa race riot is, um, is appropriate today. I mean, the, what happened there and with the racial tension and everything else, with all the things happening in, in um, Missouri and New York, et cetera, uh, it's obvious that there's still a fair amount of racial tension going on. So it's, it's still kind of a current story. And that's a, one of the things that people have told me about my book, uh, Hidden History of Tulsa, is that you don't have to be from Tulsa to really identify with the stories because they're mostly about people. And you can put that person in any city, in any environment, frankly. You know, Creepy Carpus, the public enemy number one. Another uh, person I was just <clears throat> completely surprised about. Please go on. Unbelievable inside. guy, Creepy Carpus. Um, he was born in Montreal, uh, Alvin Karpowitz. They moved to Chicago. The family sent him to Topeka because they said he had a health condition. I think they frankly were just trying to get him out of town. And <laughs> he, at the age of 10 in Topeka, uh, creepy Carpus, named for his creepy smile, actually, uh, had his, owned his first gun at the age of 10 and uh, did runs uh, for pimps and other low-life characters. And he liked that because he said in a biography, that's where the action was. So creepy Carpus, pretty colorful guy. That you could put him in any city. Yeah, for sure. And at the end of that chapter, it took me rereading it. It was like he was trading a new friend, a little Charlie, and then he turned into, I was like, I had to reread it a couple times. Uh, that's awesome. He did. He went to Alcatraz. He, um, I've forgotten how many years he was there, but let's just say um, 25. And, <clears throat> but the law, the, uh, the, he was in Alcatraz longer than any other prisoner. He, he, was kind of a musician, and he learned how to play. He loved country, country western music. His cell, last cell, was right across from the barber shop, and so he saw a, a lot of people that would go back and forth. And he trained some people how to play musical instruments. Shortly before he was released from prison, he was sent to um, a penitentiary in the state of Washington, and there there was a young inmate named Charlie who took an interest in this music. And he said, hey man, can you teach me something about this music? I don't think I wanna play that, that, that country western stuff, but I wanna learn about this slide guitar and everything. So he taught little Charlie how to play slide guitar. Turns out, little Charlie was released and later became the infamous Charles Manson. I, this is how I felt. I'm feeling the same way again, reading that. I had to go back and for some reason, I won't lie, I was like, Marilyn Manson, he's that old? And then I'm like, I'm, a goofball no wrong Manson and uh, that was funny to me but it was it's, there's lots of just that kind of surprising stuff that you found uh, found and put in a book for us and it, it it started with this land press let's give them a bunch of credit I love their magazine I love what they're doing I would like to talk you into starting a this land press podcast but we'll do that later <laughs> but but there's just I mean even names I've heard uh, that I've read about when you when you put them in your book and then go through their story one of them the most surprising was JJ Conley what <laughs> did you enjoy your time with him he's the strangest guy I've ever interviewed <laughs> without a doubt and um, one of the most expensive too actually um, we met at Lucky's bar and we met we talked for an hour and a half or two in a little private room and I think he probably pounded down about four Pinot Pinot Noirs but he is he um, you can just point him in one direction and he's gone for about 15 20 minutes with the most outrageous stories uh, nudist camps go-go girls cops in his 
place of business, secret doors where you'd knock to get into his, his establishment at 8th and Peoria. Still there, JJ's Gourmet yes. uh, Burger Cafe. <clears throat> but it was a, a very infamous bar, which I was in a few times, actually. And you would uh-huh. knock on the back door by the parking lot, and this little slot would open, and you would say something, can't remember what it was, and let you in. And there was all kinds of people, judges, attorneys, doctors, all kinds of all kinds of people just having a really good time. He was accused of doing drugs and selling drugs and all that there. In fact, they uh, they came in a couple times unannounced and went upstairs and everywhere else and didn't find anything at all. And he just harassed them basically while they were there. Yeah, he's uh, he seems like a, a a fun character, but also a little bit strange. I can see that. And I have driven by JJ's. A couple times, and I never see it open. And I was like, man, I'd like to try that place. And in the book, you talk about why, because he's open like five minutes a, a year, essentially. <laughs> Approximately, yeah. <laughs> and then, sometimes not that much. <laughs> sometimes, he, and just I don't know. I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I if I want to eat there more now or want to just stay away. I don't, I'm so I don't know if his marketing plan is working on me because like I can't have it, so now I want it. Or if that attitude's trying to make me like, never ever go there. Uh, that's probably the well, best decision. I would say you should go. Yeah. I'd say you should go. It, it, <laughs> it's, um, but if you do go, and when you do go, and I'll go with you, here's the deal. Let's do it. Okay. Here's the deal. Um, don't wear cut off shorts, no tank tops. Make sure that, that, that you've bathed recently. That's sometimes a problem for me, I guess. But anyways, before I go in there, I get dressed up and cleaned up and spiffed up. Because if he doesn't like the way you look, this is what he does. Or or you or you tell him that you want your burger medium rare. And he goes, <laughs> really? <laughs> medium rare. <clears throat> he said, uh, at that point in time, he may ask you for your club card. And I have been in there when he's done that. And people go, uh, what? He said, this is a <laughs> private club. Do you Just show me your club card and we're going to be okay. And they don't have it. He goes, well, adios. And the person who says, give me a medium rare burger. He goes, you know what? I'll tell you what. Go right out this door. Go right out the front door. Yeah. Turn to the left. Go up to 15th Street, and you'll find a number of places to cook that burger any way you want it. And, and he just walks away, and they are flabbergasted, and they get up and walk out and go out the front door. I don't know what they do. So he's a real, he's a real character. He um, is very into clothes. He's, he'll have on uh, a vest and, and some fancy suit pants, and uh, he's very... Uh, He's, a, he's one of the first hipsters, probably. And, <laughs> and he started to uh, realize that he's getting a little too old to be a hipster. But then he just didn't care. Yeah, just you're committed. You yeah, just go forget for about it. it. I, I can't, if you got a problem with me dressing and being who I am, then, you know, then what you, you can do with that. Then you can go Anywhere. to Cherry Street Oops. and eat a, a cheaper burger. That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was going to go to next. I, I have to respect his his decisions of his business but it's just it's very very goofy i think and i'd love to go with you and see it actually yeah. i'm going to the opera i think on my birthday in march i'll be in a tux so that might be the only day of my life i'm allowed in this restaurant <laughs> i actually had uh, had experience i think i wouldn't like it because i had a very minimal experience at a restaurant where we had made a reservation for eight of us and so we couldn't fit in the bar area of this restaurant which is the only place i'd ever set so so they set us in like the main dining area and I was there for their burgers because I love their burgers. And they're like, they very, very conceitedly said, oh, we can't serve those out here. And it's like, if you were setting like six inches over, we can serve you a burger. But in the main dining room, the, the guests don't appreciate that. And I was like, I got to go. I got to leave. I'm going to eat somewhere else. So I can't imagine I would really do well in JJ's Gourmet Burgers. I, I think that's probably the normal reaction to that. Uh, just a couple quick things before we leave JJ Conley. That uh, You'd mentioned the, the um, limited number of burgers. He used to make, he used to sell 30 a day, and he cut it down to 20 because he just didn't want to work that long. <laughs> and he starts at 11 o'clock in the morning, and he can be open as late as 2. But when he sells those 20, it's, it's over. Just, it's, yeah, out of here. And you just have no idea when that might be. And they're expensive. He um, has a a real um, pride in having the most expensive hamburger in town. And so sometimes he will go to restaurants in Utica Square and see what their hamburgers are. 
And if they've upped their price, then he just goes back and raises his. He's done everything he can to thwart business. You can't call. He doesn't have a phone number. He took that out. He made (laughs) his parking lot smaller. (laughs) So his business plan is not what you would learn in school. (laughs) <laughs> he went to a different business school, he one did. of those in, in California. Uh, I remember I was one of his antics where you in in your book he was, I guess, he was on the news and got a big line. So he just there was a line of people out front. So he closed the restaurant for several weeks. Yeah, great business model. Yeah, he got too much attention from that, and he said they were lined up out the door. He said, "Forget it." So he closed the doors for two weeks till that kind of wore off, and then he started again. So with your business model, as your, your book gains popularity and more and more sales, do you print less and less books? Is that, are you copying that same business model? <laughs> you want your book to be only for, you can only read it from 11 to 2, mm. and if you read 20 pages, you got to stop for the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if I could charge like 200 bucks <laughs> a book, it's kind of like a cult wine. <laughs> we make a cult book. If I had the control over that... Um, I still wouldn't do that, but I, I don't think that'd be a good business model, actually. <laughs> the, the book is uh, published by History Press in uh, Charleston, and so on a serious note, I don't really have any um, any control over that sort of thing. But I've really enjoyed doing presentations at the Tulsa Historical Society and um, Woody Guthrie Center and uh, the Osage uh, Nation Museum in Pawhuska and all over the place. Let I. Let's talk more about yourself and coming into writing. And I'll generally ask a super hippie question, which I, I think you're going to be okay with, but this one isn't, isn't so hippie. I, I'm excited to meet you because I've kind of seen my town through your eyes the past couple of weeks. When I visit a place, I can see it through your verbal description of what you pointed out, of looking at the view, maybe in Standpipe Hill or Cherry Street, watching the trolleys. Uh, were you expecting that kind of, of reaction when you decided to write? I did expect that people would um, learn more than the obvious. We know there was a riot. I mean, although that was kept under covers for a long time, now we're aware of that. Um, We know there's a standpipe hill, which now has that huge tower from OSU on it. Um, We knew about some of these things. Um, We knew there were criminals. We knew there were country western musicians here, but um, we we didn't know much about the colorful kind of underbelly of it. So... A lot of people have said the same thing that they go. I just didn't have any idea that this was going on, and I, I and when they and when they drive by, I think I, mean, I can't speak for them, but I, but I could try. But I can speak for myself, and that is when I drive down Elgin between Fifth and Sixth, and it's now a big parking lot on the east side of the road. It's where the Coliseum was, the original BOK, and so and when I drive by Standpipe Hill, you know, I, I just makes me think about it. Go down Sixth Street by Blake Ewing's place, by the Phoenix, and, and, um, and Kay Rahal's place. Um, yeah, the Eclipse. I, I was cool reading about a place I've actually played a few times in, and uh, in, in Canes, too. But yeah. So those places are, are, when I drive by them, they um, I have sort of a, um, a sense of place about all these little individual places that, that I've had an opportunity to uh, learn about, research, write about, publish. And I, I imagine it has um, somewhat the same effect for, for some of the readers. I would love that if that happened. Yeah, I, I really in, enjoy uh, reading about things that I see. But you're right, I hadn't seen them in that way. That's more than the obvious. That's a great way to put that. I really, I really enjoy that. Um, what, what, I guess you already said, what took you into writing? You were like, I kind of want to write for your magazine. And then how did it turn into, let's write a book? I I wrote quite a few stories for This Land Press, which I really appreciate, and I'm a kind of a contributing editor for them and that sort of business, and um, uh, they've been very kind to me. So I had all these stories, and History Press contacted This Land and said, we're interested in coming into Tulsa. We are a regional book seller, publisher, so, and we're not in Oklahoma at all. We would love to come into Tulsa, and we want to know somebody who could write uh, an interesting book. And they suggested me. So History Press called me, and I we chatted a little bit. They have several core series, and one and um, you know like foods of river cities or something. Like. Yeah. And one of them is hidden history of Cleveland, hidden history of Hot Springs, and they 
I said, you know, I, I have 19 published stories, uh, and almost all of them are Tulsa-based. Maybe we have a hist hidden history of Tulsa. This was last February. <clears throat> they um, felt that made sense. I had kind of an instant book. I used 17 of my published stories in this land and two other stories that were not published in this land. And within three weeks, I had a manuscript and 54 pictures I put together, and we were done. That's pretty fast. Yeah. And it came out in, in May, and it's it's sold pretty well. It's sold on Amazon, Barnes & Noble online, and in the stores. It's an iTunes book, uh, ebook, and all that. And it's, uh, for me, when I get the sales reports, it's pretty interesting to see where where these books are being sold. They won't tell me all the things, but they're in museums and libraries around the country. Excellent. Yeah, I when I first was looking for your book. I went to a couple of stores around town and they, they were out. And I was like, I was first excited for you. I hadn't even met you yet. And I was excited. I was like, great. I'm glad this book is doing well. So I had to start with buying it. It's so easy to buy it just on your phone. You can buy it right there on iTunes or I'm sure Android has a version. And then I actually, I think I bought the last two copies at OSU Tulsa's bookstore. So I was just pumped for you. I'm really excited that, that people are interested in this and that I get to, to hang out with you and have a conversation with you. Huh. Uh, well, I'm enjoying it, and, and thank you very much. It's nice to, it's nice to run out of books, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then, and then, as an author, um, what you hope for is that they get replenished pretty quickly, and that's doesn't always happen. But I, um, um, I, well, I got a call on Christmas, uh, Christmas the 23rd of December, from um, Decapolis downtown at Eighth and uh, Boston sells my books. And he wanted some, he's called, he's frantic. He said, I need some books. I need books. And so <laughs> I, had, I have a, my own stash that I use for my presentations and sell myself. So I took him a whole slug of books. Barnes & Noble called and said, we need 100 books now. And they couldn't get them from History Press out in South Carolina. So, you know, that's been pretty nice to go out there. And, and, and going out to the Barnes & Noble on 71st Street, I looked like, I looked like heck. I mean, I hadn't done anything. And I just I rushed out there, and I had my little beanie hat, my little newsboy hat on. And, <laughs> and I walked in, and they got on the PA system. They said, author Steve Gherkin is here with his new book, Hidden History. And if you're interested in meeting him, come on by. So I, <laughs> I had 50 books. We sold over 20 books and just like that. They didn't even give you a green room or anything. No, no. I, I <laughs> green room i didn't get <laughs> i didn't get bagels or coke or nothing i got nothing but i got to sell some books and i got to meet some pretty cool people that's that's great i i like that story i like picturing that uh, i was also thinking about how if i were to ever just emergency need cds to sell i could just print them so then i was kind of picturing you with at your computer printer like printing an emergency hundred books i don't think it's quite as simple for you as it would be <laughs> for me uh, probably not but i i have a few boxes of them <laughs> Just in case. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm very glad you got into writing. I mean, for me, I got to learn all this stuff, and all I had to do was buy a book. I didn't have to do any research. I just got to get to know these things. And a character I hadn't heard of was J.B. Stratford. Can you shed a little light on him? I, I, I want to quote you from your video First Charge, Last Freed. And that's just an incredible, incredible story all the way through. Thank you. It is an incredible story. J.B. Stratford came to Tulsa in 1899. And the opening line of, of the, the first paragraph says, John the Baptist came to Tulsa in 1899. So a lead is supposed to get your attention. <laughs> it and, did. And if you have any <laughs> smattering of religious uh, education, you probably know that John the Baptist was an important figure Absolutely. in the Bible. So it w went on from there. But J.B. Um, uh, was uh, a son of a slave family. And he became well-educated, became an attorney. When he moved to Tulsa, he was 35 years old, so not a new kid. But all that was happening in Greenwood on the north side of the tracks, there was dusty, worthless, nobody wanted it. A uh, piece of land was um, beginnings of real estate transactions that he and O.W. Gurley did. And he was a very outspoken and disliked person, respected by the white community, but despised. They were tickled to death when bad things happened to J.B. Stratford. <laughs> tickled to death. Because he was all for racial justice. And frankly, you know, in the turn of the century and 
teens. That wasn't just real popular in in Tulsa, with at least uh, a handful or more, probably quite a few more yeah. people. Not everybody was bad. Not everybody was a racist, but certainly that was kind of the uh, feeling du jour. Yeah. And he he um, he was a very he was the wealthiest man, Jason, at the time of the race riot. On June 1, 1921, he was worth around $1.6 million in our dollars, in today's dollars. He was, uh, he had 16 buildings. He had a hotel he named after himself, right by the Greenwood Cultural Center. It was, uh, had a jazz club. It was right across from the Commodore Cotton Club. So as a musician, you should be excited about that. Right now, it's where the uh, 244 uh, traverses Greenwood. But there was music. There were bookstores, record stores, dry cleaners, grocery stores, hotels, uh, fashion stores. It was a happening place. Green was a happening place. And J.B. Stratford was right in the middle of it. There were three black newspapers on Greenwood in that first stretch. And he was great friends with the Tulsa Star uh, owner. And they they would write things that would provoke the... uh, the uh, south side of the railroad track, shall we say, downtown yeah. White Tulsa. Yeah. <clears throat> and he would take, um, he took um, the, the state government to task on the law about railroads. They had to have separate cars for blacks and whites. And, and with the federal laws that have been passed, that was not really appropriate. And he took them to task and lost, of course. But um, and he occasionally, when he traveled, he would be moved when this when the rail car came from Kansas, where he had been with his um, uh, visiting his brother in Independence. He would come across a state line into Oklahoma. They would stop the train. They'd move John the Baptist Stradford from the mixed car, the white black car, back to a black car and make him ride by himself in this fairly. Um, uh, uh, demeaning boxcar, if you will, to yeah. get back to Tulsa. So he didn't like that, and he I'm was sure. not afraid. He was not afraid to stand up. He was not afraid to stand up, but he didn't stand very tall, Jason. He was probably five foot six, a little bit stocky, pencil thin mustache, piercing eyes, and his relatives called him um, a person who was strong as a Mandingo warrior. And he, he wound up losing everything in in the riot. Terrible. That whole thing. Every time I just just think about it, it's just terrible. But it has not a happy ending. But there is also like a blessing at the end. I guess. Can we? His family fought for literally generations for him. What happened with with that? J. B. Stratford, um, after he was detained in the riot, took a rail car, went to Independence, Kansas, was indicted two days later for being the f- first person to incite the riot. Okay. I just remembered a question. Sure. Can I interrupt the story? I wish you would. In, in the <laughs> in the book, he you say maybe it's not in the book. Maybe it's just one of your interviews. You say that he was taken to Brady and didn't know where his wife was. Did his wife end up in the train with him? Do we know that? Could I could never find. He was not. She was not on the train with him. Somehow uh, she got to Independence, Kansas, and I have no clue how. That's Good. where his where um, where his brother lived. So he was alone on the train. And as he left uh, town, it was a rainy day. It was a day or so after the uh, riot, and he could see, look up Greenwood, and he could see his hotel burned and ash. Just it was total destruction. So he he lost more than money. He lost his black sense of place because that's kind of what Greenwood was for all these people that took up there. But he went to he wound up in Chicago with his relatives. He died in 1935. He was exonerated in 1996, and it nearly took an act of God to make that happen. For years, they tried to get him exonerated and other people who were charged uh, with uh, inciting to write. By the way, the penalty, just by the way, the, the, the penalty for incite to riot, if you were guilty of that, could be life imprisonment or death. So people were fighting their extraditions back to Tulsa, and he was one of those. In 1996, uh, one of the relatives approached uh, Bill of Fortune when he was the district attorney and said, we really think it's time for our relative John the Baptist Stratford to probably 
be exonerated. And um, they did some research into it. And just like you, when you read this book, and other people when they read the book, are just alarmed that this happened at all to JB. They uh, granted his exoneration. Stradfordians from all over the country came back to Tulsa for the first time in 70 years to the Greenwood Cultural Center. And with just a stroke of a pen and a couple words from a black justice, he was exonerated. But it took 75 years after the, he was first charged to be exonerated. So first charged, last freed. That's where that quote comes in. I, I find myself constantly amazed that even in, in 1996, it took so much work for, for somebody to look into that. So did, you, did it affect your mood? looking into these things? How did that affect you as, as an author? If you're okay talking about that. I like talking about writing songs and, and just what kind of mood I'm in comes through the song. Did it affect your, just your outlook looking into all of this? Yes. I, I wouldn't say it's made me a different man, but I'd say it's made me um, a deeper man. I seven of the 19 stories in Hidden History of Tulsa deal with racial tension or, or black issues. I have, um, I have become at least, and not, with, not just within myself, but uh, uh, verbally and uh, in things that I have, a uh, way that I have uh, run my life and things that I've tried to help with have um, really taken up the cause for uh, social justice and in particularly the black community. Uh, there are just a wonderful, wonderful, huge group of, of, of black community uh, um, citizens, and everybody deserves to have uh, equal freedoms, equal rights. And yeah, I'm just a little bit PO'd about some of these things. I mean, I, has it changed my life? Yeah, it's really changed my life. Yeah, I, I would like to, I'd like to agree. I think even just reading your book, it, I, I mean, I guess what, that's what writing and, and language is for, isn't it? To, Every little thing you learn is it, it kind of sticks with you. So thank you for, I mean, taking that on. As as how I'll say that. Thank you for doing that. That's really great to get that to get this information out. I actually, when I first decided to learn about, I mean, I don't want to. Your book is very colorful with all kinds of different stories. But when I first went to to read about the race riots, I found a podcast first because that's how my in the past years I that's how my life works, and then just. Just knowing what Greenwood was at the beginning of this podcast, I realized that that they had no idea what they were talking about. It was they called it Greenwood was a suburb of Tulsa, a few miles away kind of thing. And I was like, no, I'm gonna stop listening now. So, so I really appreciate you giving this information in in a very well told, interesting way. So, Thank you. And, you know, and you had mentioned it earlier, uh, the miss information it's a trove of misinformation on the in, on the internet and even some books frankly don't quite get it right um, it's real nice when you get a lot of research and the story which winds up with 3,000 words or 3,500 words I may have 30 pages of research yeah. and that that's what I've just melted down from all this other stuff I mean this is 30 good pages of research you really realize there are um, some well-intended people who just didn't get it quite right. And the other thing about This Land Press is that um, like any um, uh, top-notch literary organization has a, a fact finder on staff. So when you submit a story to This Land, for instance, or The New Yorker, for instance, they really take it apart. And I may get 30 questions out of a 3,000 word article, really? We tried to find this. We couldn't find this. How, 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 are you, how sure are you of that? And can you show us exactly where that came from? And so I, I, had, I don't mind that. I mean, I'm a little annoyed sometimes but because uh, <laughs> it, takes, it takes some time. But, <clears throat> but the bottom line is it makes the article extremely credible, and you can count on it being factually correct. Yeah, and I appreciate that you could actually go to everything everything you wrote about you had the opportunity to go look for yourself so it wasn't just an outside outsider i mean I'm, you're a tulsa now you said you weren't originally but but accept it if my acceptance matters sure. <laughs> but but it's really cool to me that you that i mean when you talked about something it wasn't just there's facts there but it wasn't just that it was also your you being there and that kind of took takes a person there so it takes somebody so outside of tulsa you can 
kind of visit through your words, and that's just a cool, cool experience, I think. When I wrote uh, Standpipe Hill, which is um, just northwest of Greenwood that we're talking about, the riot, and uh, we're just west of OSU Tulsa uh, in Tulsa, I was able, they had not built that monument up there to OSU at the time. So huh. I took a, uh, uh, a bunch of coffee and a folding chair and went up, and I was able to hike up to the top of Standpipe Hill. And I got there about seven o'clock in the morning. So the rush hour traffic and everything else. And it was just to sit there and gaze over everything and, and just, you talk about a hippie thing, but just, to be, <laughs> just to be able to mentally take out the new buildings and then look at what you have and you start and then you could almost kind of put in old style buildings and where the new ones were and you could and knowing knowing quite a bit about the lay of the land because of the research it was pretty amazing pretty amazing um experience for me and and i i got a real um sense of it i think i got it backwards i think i went to the wrong hill I went to visit. I went. To, I went to the. Well, I think it's still a standpipe pill. It's just separated by a street now. And on one side is the tower, and I visited the other side. Uh, Actually, you were still on standpipe. Standpipe Hill uh, was uh, dissected by well, trisected by Cincinnati and um, and um, one of those other streets down there. Yeah, <laughs> but Cincinnati was <laughs> Cincinnati was the main one went through it. So actually, it was a big hill it Very was a large. big huge mound and standpipe because it had a, um, a 300 foot um, or 150 foot excuse me 150 foot standpipe water reservoir huge i mean you could see it from everywhere and it was all it was black in color and uh, ominous uh, little symbol standing there on the top of the hill if you were to go down standpipe hill to the west to the very bottom you would run into what's now Kane's Ballroom and 244. Yeah. On the other side of, of 244 there is, a, is an empty lot. And the empty lot was the Ku Klux Klan clubhouse called Beano Hall. Beano Hall. An amazing three-story stucco white, by the way, white stucco <laughs> building that could house 3,000 people in the auditorium. And it was um, the, where the Ku Klux Klan in Tulsa um, took up shop. They had been around for a while, and they were, they were definitely involved in the riot of 1921. But by the spring of 1922, 12 months later, they had a huge edifice right within, the dist right within walking distance, spitting distance, if you will, of the ashes of Greenwood, just been burned to the ground. And they did midnight marches. They did ice cream socials, though. <sighs> they, had, um, they had Ku Klux Klan Jr. They had a little plan for teenage boys. Um, they had uh, a Ku Klux Klan Corral, that's with the K. Um, it was a pretty amazing place. They they decided politicians' futures there. They were very involved in politics for a number of years. Many things happened in Bino. It was really called the Tulsa Benevolent Association. Really? Yeah. Tulsa Benevolent, but it but it became known to the locals as Bino, as in Bino Jews, Bino Catholics, Bino Niggers, Bino immigrants. And they, uh, they meant it, really. A handful really meant it. Everybody joined the Klan back then. It was like joining um, Kiwanis or, you know, the Rotary Club. It was crazy. And then, then a lot of them made, uh, got out pretty quickly. But there was, some, there was a hardcore element. I, I'm taken aback. I, I'm stuck on 3,000 people. That is a huge building. Uh, Brady Theater, I think, holds seats 2,500. For those from not Tulsa, it's like a, a big theater. Kane's Ballroom uh, is 1,700. So double what Kane's will hold. That's an extremely large building. I want to I wanna hear a little bit about, I have the names wrote down. I would like to talk about Watts and Clary. That is a tremendous, a person making a better decision to at the later part of his life, I believe. And uh, would you like to talk about that some? You bet. In the book, there are a number of, of negative things about about um, racial prejudice and, and that sort of business. This this story um, 
is very concerned with with social justice, uh, black social justice, and it has a great uh, positive end to it. So I'm a real fan of this story, Watson Cleary. Wade Watts was a, a, a black man. He lived in McAllister. He uh, he pastored the Jerusalem Baptist Church, but he was also the leader of the NAACP in Oklahoma for 18 years, I believe. And he was a very uh, stand-up kind of guy. He he had um, 12 or 13 kids. He raised um, J.C. Watts, a former congressman. He raised his illegitimate daughter that he had when he was in high school with a white girl. So he took he took Tia in and was um, uh, part of the family. He was he he really was the 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 pastor of love. I mean, he he was like Doctor Love without a doubt. Yeah. He um, he really did not get too upset with people that uh, the white supremacists when they would uh, when. They, he would be accosted by them. He'd just say, "Jesus loves you," and, and uh, the he could just put them down by by with Bible verses. It was a pretty amazing story. Johnny Lee Clary, on the other hand, was a white kid um, born in Dell City near Oklahoma City, and he uh, had a very troubled family life. He walked in one day as a nine or ten year old to his dad holding a forty five caliber pistol to his temple and running towards his dad, don't do it, don't do it, and watching his brain splatter all over the wall. I mean, that probably will change your psyche as a young person. For sure. And it was just a, a racist family, without a doubt. He, um, he was searching for a community of some sort, Johnny Lee Clary. He was a professional wrestler for a while and had some success. He was the Arkansas professional state champion in the heavyweight division, and he was just a... He was a, he was a, uh, he was a badass, really. He loved fights. He loved to, he, but he was a very lonely person. Uh, he, when he was in California uh, as a youngster, it was certainly shortly after the dad uh, killed himself, he was shipped off to California because his mom decided that she'd rather have her boyfriend live with her than Johnny Lee. So she shipped Johnny Lee out. Didn't do too much for him either. But out there, he discovered the Klan, and they loved him. His young little kid, you know, all his ideas. So he found his community with the Klan, came back to Oklahoma, became the, the Grand Dragon of Oklahoma at the age of 21. And, and the head of the NAACP was Wade Watts, this black gentleman we were talking about. So he was his target. They met in 1979 in Oklahoma City in a radio show. And Johnny Lee thought, I am going to absolutely roast this guy. I can hardly wait to get a, the black leader of the NAACP on air. I'm just, he's toast. So he told all of his little clan buddies, and they told all their buddies, and you can imagine them crowding around the radio, having their Jack Daniels and watching old Johnny Lee, waiting for Johnny Lee to roast him. As it turned out, whatever Johnny Lee could try to say, an insult, uh, Wade, it just didn't work, and Wade was just said very kind and loving things back to him. Johnny Lee stormed out. The long short of it is Johnny Lee becomes the imperial wizard of the White Knights, the Ku Klux Klan. That was his goal. It's what he wanted to do. He was uh, it was a short-lived deal. He found out that the Klan really was not a, a good community, that they really hated each other with all the Aryan brothers and all these little white groups uh, within the clan were fighting against each other. So he he, he quit. He um, burned his robe. He was living, by the way, in the backyard of his apartment at 71st and Lewis. So when he was Imperial Wizard, he's living here in Tulsa, good old USA, and um, he had had enough. He picked up his gun, sitting by a window, the light streaming through on the table. There was a book. He put the gun to his head to end his life the way his dad did. And the light shone down on, on the book, and it was a Bible. He picked it up and read, just started reading, put the gun down, uh, became a member of the Victory Christian Center, um, uh, Billy Joe Doherty, which is, is that still 71st and Lewis mm -hmm. right there? Yeah, 71st, 70, 81st almost. Yeah. 
and he became a preacher. He called Wade Watts two years later, the man that he had been harassing, the man whom, by the way, he and his buddies burned down his church, the same guy that they went into a restaurant and tormented and intimidated him and said awful things to him. He called him and he said, look, I made some mistakes. What I want to atone for that. And Wade said, Johnny Lee, Claire, you come to my church in McAllister and you preach at my church. You give your first sermon at my church. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. He did that. And at the end of, at the, end of the service, he, he asked for the, the, the commitment call. If you want to turn your life over to Jesus Christ, come on down the aisle and all that. And, and three little kids, black children, came down the aisle. One of them, the first one that came by, uh, Wade Watts leaned over to Johnny Lee and said, that's Tia. You are bringing Tia to the Lord. Tia was the little black baby of J.C. Watts who Wade all those years ago in 1979 held up to Johnny Lee and said, how can you hate this baby? So Johnny Lee brings her into into the official into Christianity, they become big buddies. They do evangelistic things, travel the country, uh, great friends. And Johnny Lee, I talked to three times. He became um, a televangelist for the Jimmy Swaggart Televangelistic Ministries in Bat- Baton Rouge. Wow. And so I talked to him three times, and I that my little digital recorder um, was just. Hopping on the table, I'll tell you what. Uh-huh. His, oh, Johnny Lee was um, a, um, a pretty vocal guy. And, uh, oh, man, he was just full of brim and firestone. He was unbelievable. And he was very straightforward. And I asked him some pretty pointed questions. And he gave me, I think, real answers. And a lot of it I could find in research where he'd said it to other people. He died about uh, two months ago and was buried in Miami, Oklahoma, which is where he uh, preached before he became part of the Swagger team. Wow, what a story! There you have it. Well, there's more, but that's yeah, the, but you know what? It's in the book. Quite a bit more to read in the book. Yeah. and I want to talk about how you started that. It, I had to reread. There's another time I was like, "What did you just say, Mr. Gherkin?" Mm-hmm. NAACP president, Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, roommates, and that's just that's all I'll say. That's true, uh, but. There's plenty more to read in that chapter, and just plenty more to read just about everything about the Zeppelin, things that I didn't know. Let's go back and go back to Standby Pill. Let's take you there mentally and, and talk about some of the things that you see going out when you take away some of the modern buildings. You take away BOK Center, uh, you take away, I mean, Keynes wasn't even there yet, but I, I kind of had heard rumors that on top of one of the buildings, there's a big tower, and we talk a little bit about what that actually is. Um. If you're sitting on the top on the top of Standby Hill and looking uh, south into um, the Brady District and then across the tracks and into into downtown, at the top of the old Exchange National Bank building is a real unusual. It looks like a uh, top of a Christmas tree. I mean, it, there's like an ornament on top yes. of this building, and it's cylindrical. And it is probably 30 feet tall. And a person who is not aware of what that might be would be startled to find out, I think. It's kind of one of those hidden nuggets of history. Yeah. That that was originally in 1928, uh, that that topping out of that bank building was um, created to moor dirigibles. That is, airships, zeppelins. Yes. Germany had been very successful um, in the 20s and the teens with uh, passenger lines of airships across Europe. So enterprising Americans thought they could do the same thing. And what happened with this dirigible that actually flew by or at 40 miles an hour, I don't know if that's flying. Zoom, zoom. Zoom, yeah, pretty much. <clears throat> <laughs> Although, you know, the top speed of the 600-foot dirigible, 600 feet, that's two football fields long. Top speed was 68. I don't know how they arrived at that, but 68 miles an hour. So 40 miles an hour, it was just cruising by. And um, it 
the picture shows, this is the front of the book actually, it shows, it looks as though it's headed for the top of this ornament on top of the building, this mooring. And the mooring actually, if you were to look at a diagram of it, and they, um, it would be, uh, have a spiral staircase in the center of this wrought iron, 10 foot in diameter, 30 feet tall stack, really. And the way it would be was to be used, which it never was, actually, is the dirigible motors up to the top of this building. Remember, there's wind. Yeah, <laughs> those things are hard to control. I'm sure. And from the tip of the from the tip of the dirigible, a gangplank is lowered down and secured. Somebody's got to get out there <laughs> and tether it to the top of that mooring. And then the passengers would walk through uh, on, off the, down the gangplank, if you will, and down the spiral staircase. And then the idea was they'd go back up and, and leave. Uh, that's what it was. So you could see that. You can still see it. It's, it's very clear. Once yeah. you know what, it's, what it is, it's one of those things. You can't you, miss it. Yeah, you drive by and go, that's cool. Because the dirigible, 600-foot vehicle that is not a blimp a blimp deflates yeah but this has an infrastructure a metal infrastructure so it's a rigid airship and they would moor it and it would just rotate around because they had a number of these moorings this was uh, uss los angeles was named the dirigible that came by tulsa in 1927 and uh 1929 excuse me um at its, its home port in uh, New Jersey, it had a mooring like that. And also, it did 331 missions, this USS Los Angeles, by the way, which was a gift to us from the German government as reparations for World War I. It actually traveled all over the Pacific Ocean doing reconnaissance for enemy ships. And they had a tanker ship dedicated to this dirigible. And the tail is a huge tanker. They had one of these moorings. And so they, they moored it all the time. So it wasn't just something that never happened it just never happened here yeah that's that's cool that you can go see that now i'm picturing actually on top of mayo building as it's a great place to go see it a better place to see it is actually the cover of your book it's a beautiful picture of it right there uh but i wanted to talk about that for a minute because that's just a cool thing a cool rumor is what it is like i had no way of really i guess i could have searched it but like somebody says that used to be for a zeppelin that came through I'm like, no way there's no way that's true and then Totally true. That's what it was built for. Exactly true. And the, <laughs> and the picture on the front of the book was taken, like you just mentioned, from the top of the mail building. There's a oh, second great. picture on the inside of the book, which, which looks to um, the southwest by Turkey Mountain, for you familiar with Tulsa. Yes. So it was coming from Amarillo, where it just topped up, topped off with some helium, frankly. And it was going, so it was going from Amarillo, the helium plant, where just full of helium and all, you know, ducky, to Tulsa, to Chicago, to Lakehurst, uh, New Jersey, where it, where it lived, if you will. There's a photo from the top of the mail building looking southwest. A number of office buildings. It's a huge picture. This is a, this is a mammoth-sized picture, by the way, yeah. uh, in, in reality. You can see on the tops of the buildings hundreds of men in white shirts look at the, watching the zeppelin come motoring towards tulsa at 40 yeah. miles an hour and ladies are up there people are climbing up like these metal ladders in the outside of buildings to yeah. go watch this thing come by it's a real spectacle it was a big event yeah i i kind of want that to happen even though we're so much further i would i would totally climb a building to see that happen again yeah incredible another cool story let's first thank you again for coming you're welcome and, and joining uh i i want to to talk a little bit about somebody that visited our Kane's ballroom quite a bit. We're setting, I don't know if you've got to talk about, but I bought these chairs that we're all setting in uh, from Kane's. I think these were there from, I'm not sure if it was 1924, but but close. But I want to talk about Mr. Mr. Spade Cooley. Pleasure to talk about <laughs> that rascal. <laughs> um, Indeed. Yeah. Donnell Conley, um, born uh, near the beginning of the century um, in western Oklahoma, in a place called Grand Oklahoma, as I recall. They, the family moved out to Oregon and moved to California. They were a family of fiddlers. Spade Cooley 
is Don L was his real name. He um, he was a poker player, and one night when he was a, a farmer, an itinerant farmer in the Central Valley of um, of California, he was playing poker with his buddies and boozing it up and doing all that. He got he he won five hands in a row with spade flushes, and his name became Spade from that poker event. <laughs> yeah. And he, and he was a very accomplished um, fiddle player. And Western Swing was really very popular because um, really the, the Grapes of Wrath kind of movement, Okies and Texans moving to California, and they wanted Western Swing. And, and this, this guy had lots of personality. And um, he, he did quite well with his band. He considered himself the, the king of Western Swing. But we know that's not true. We know that ain't true. <clears throat> of course, Bob Wills, is, uh, hands down. Uh, there were two different styles of music, and um, that may not be what you want to know, but um, but uh, Spade Cooley was kind of the uh, Duke Ellington. He was kind of like the suave, uh, orchestral, more arrangements of swing, and Bob Wills was, was not. He was Texas swing. Spade, Spade had some problems, though, didn't he? Yeah, <laughs> so I've read. Uh, I... Yes. He he became, I mean, you know, we all maybe enjoy our cocktail from time to time, but um, Spade liked his often and, and a lot of them. He had uh, several kids and a beautiful wife, Ella May, who was in his band for a long time. He became uh, delusional. His alcohol started really affecting him. He started considering the um, possibility that his wife was having affairs. Of course, it didn't matter that he was really a man about town if you yeah. know what i'm saying and um he had a television show a radio show ronald reagan was a, a great friend of his he was on his television show a, a lot he was in the 50s the mid 50s he was making a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a week our money our time when oh. he when he lost his show his tv show the final coup de gras he had 15 million dollars in the bank wow <laughs> i mean i don't care if it's now or then or tomorrow Ever. that's a lot of money yeah a lot of money but he he was in deep yogurt and he was now into pills and booze and he and his wife um, uh, had a very acrimonious uh, relationship uh, kissing makeup and uh, then then beat each other up and then kiss and makeup again and and um the details of it are pretty gruesome. He, he wound up uh, killing his wife, murdering his wife, and going to prison. 1961, he was convicted um, of murdering his wife. He had a heart condition, actually, so they didn't send him um, uh, to the, the, the real um, uh, scary uh, penal institutions in, in California. They sent him to a little place near Napa Valley. Terrible weather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. So he was there for uh, he was he 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 got a life sentence though, so he's going to be in wine country for the rest of his life. And then, uh, nine years later, though, Ronald Reagan arranged for a pardon of his good buddy, yeah, murderous the murderous king of Western Swing, the murderous maestro of Western Swing, Spade Cooley, nine years, and he 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 was appreciative. Um, he was a little bit surprised. He was also surprised when one night they uh, they took him out of his cell and put him in a limo, gave him a nice suit, got into his limo, and they said, "We're gonna, you're gonna play some music. You're gonna play some music. Great." Didn't know where he was going. Had no idea what was happening. And they took him to a um, a huge coliseum in Oakland. Still didn't know what was going on. And the Oakland, the, the parking lot was jammed with cars. And he said, must be some wrestling tonight. Yeah. And he had no idea. They were there for him. And so he played for the Oakland County Sheriff's Association, a fundraiser. Chill Wills was the announcer, a good buddy of his. He played his set. The third song, and which was the last song he played in his set, was his number one hit, Shame on You. Amazing the murder of Spade Cooley's number one tune was called Shame, Shame on, on you. you. Yeah. <clears throat> but the the crowd went nuts. 
and he came off of the stage just glowing. He, he just received this pardon. He played again to thousands of adoring fans, and he said to his friends, I, you know, I think this is going to work for me. And he walked into his dressing room to get ready for the second show, and he died on the concrete floor. He was holding a broken neck when he fell. His fiddle broke. And in one hand, he had the broken fiddle neck, and the other, he had a photograph of Ella May, the wife who he'd murdered, and him. And um, so he, 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 he basically, Jason, he died to a standing ovation. Incredible ending to a story. That's, I, I wanted to ask if he knew that he was going to be free afterwards. Is that how that worked? Did he, do you think he knew? He knew. Okay. He knew, and the date, which I don't recall exactly, was going to be on his 60th birthday. Oh, just a little birthday present from Ronnie. Yeah, from his ex. I mean, because when he was on his show, he wasn't. That's correct. He, he was not governor. He was just an actor at the time. He was on Spade Show. That's crazy and cool. I'm. I'm. Thank you so much for You're welcome. for teaching me all these things. Thank you for for coming here and talking to our listeners about. I appreciate it. the opportunity. And I I really enjoy having you here, getting to to meet you after reading your book. And I'm going to interrupt right here to say, please check out our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash from a basement in Tulsa. There'll be a link below in the description. And we're going to give away a signed copy of Steve's book, Hidden History of Tulsa. And we'll announce it on next week's episode. So please check us out on Facebook and learn how to get a free copy of the book. Here's the last word from Steve Gherkin. Do you have anything else you'd like to, to throw out there? I would say um, keep your ear to the ground, Tulsans, because there's a lot of history that's hidden.